you're away. You're Terrific. Away Terrific. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, some of uh, you I know, I'm, sh I'm sure. Um, some of you I don't. So hopefully, um, at the end of this uh, presentation, you will be able to uh, understand what we're doing within the remanufacturing space um, and um, where our journey has been uh, and where the immediate future uh, looks. Uh, my name is Steve Haskew, as I said. Um, I'm uh, part of the Circular Computing team. Um, we uh, are, are proud to uh, recognise ourselves as carbon neutral as an organisation. We have a science-based target to reduce our, our carbon emissions every year. Um, I'm, a, I'm a member of the BSI committee for remanufacturing, specifically uh, committee TDW4, which looks at um, a standard 8887, which is now gaining pace towards, uh, towards a standard. Uh, we've just recently been allowed uh, onto a framework to supply central government and local government departments and we see that to be a, a key motivator for our business and we also advise uh, our central government, uh, the UN uh, and the EU. Computing is 25 years old. It is part of uh, an organisation that has specialised in logistics. That is the, the collection of unwanted assets, PBIT in this, in this case, focusing on laptop technology, and we remarket that technology into the aftermarket. And up until very recently, this was well known worldwide as a refurbished asset. However, in 2014, uh, we saw that a laptop technology was pretty much as fast and as thin as it could be and decided to invest into a remanufacturing facility where we became the world's first secondary equipment manufacturer. We remanufacture assets from Dell, HP and Lenovo and what we're able to do is to produce a piece of equipment that is comparable to new and we can do this at the rate of 10,000 units per month and as soon as we get consistent uh, three month output of, of this rate then we have the room to scale up fairly quickly to increase our capacity. The factory was built around uh, the, the standard compliance with, uh, with ISO 9001 to 14001, for instance, um, occupational health and safety 18001, but specifically with regards to uh, the quality of the asset, we have a standard called ISO 8887. And what ISO 8887 does, it defines the standard to which a remanufactured device must be made separates the, the quality between refurbished, which is general second-hand, and remanufactured, which is to announce new standard, to enable us to produce uh, the output in the volume that we, we do. We obviously need to be able to procure in the volume of the same model or skew in the volume that we need to meet uh, the supply of a large buyer. We have done this by building a very large network of companies from where we source our product. So over and above the quality of the product and our factory, and what do we have to offer you as the customer? How do we align our brand values to what we believe you want? Circular computing is at the centre of the circular economy. Our intent is to eliminate e waste and have adopted the promotion of reuse as a means of achieving this. And the way that we have engineered our business means that buyers of large volumes of laptops can get the consistent quality and consistent volume supplied to them so they can join in and have the advantages of the circular economy. All of our products come with a 36 month warranty. And what this means is that all risk with regards to products of a grade that you're not used to is removed, allowing IT and procurement teams to effectively do the right thing. Typically, our products are 30 to 40% less than the cost of brand new, which if the whole of the public sector went to circular computing, which show a saving of roughly a billion pounds over a three year period. Additionally, we worked hard to maintain carbon neutrality with our products and our organisation. From an organisational point of view, what we do is we invest uh, to offset our operational output our scope three apps, if you like, into renewable energy programs that create alternative and sustainable power sources for future generations. And furthermore, with every laptop we sell, we plant five trees, meaning that the carbon sequestered over the life of the, of the asset is also taken care of. So when we talk about a brand for purpose, these are the things that you as a client can buy into.
Change is everything. Change is the mainspring of evolution, the foundation of life on Earth. But nature's symmetry depends on exchange. We strain the perpetual cycles by taking more than we give. We lessen the sources of existence for ourselves and for coming lives. Do we realize that we need to change? That we must reinstate ourselves into the natural balance? Do we realize that we have everything it takes to make a difference? That we can effect change? As our motivation to change grows, our longing for real change intensifies. Change challenges our capacities, our modes of development. It involves all our innovative energy. Change presents opportunities everywhere to every one of us. Our chance to change is now. Change. In nature, there's zero waste. Humans are responsible for the take, make, use and dispose economy, also known as the linear economy. And this just is not sustainable as there is only 100% of, of anything. And some rare and raw precious minerals are becoming precariously slim on supply. A circular economy uses what's already been made. So if you take the shortage of supply of certain minerals and then you look at the rate at which the human race is exploiting these minerals with the doubling of the population globally in the last 50 years, it's not surprising that we have to figure out quickly an alternative solution to the consumer society in which we, we have become accustomed. August the 22nd, 2020 is the predicted date that human demand for ecological resources and services will have surpassed what the earth can regenerate in a year. So essentially what we're doing is, is mortgaging the resources of tomorrow to meet the demands of today, which is not sustainable purely by definition. And what this means by 2030 at current levels of consumption is that we're going to need two worths to fulfill the demand of consumer society. But if you actually look at predicted levels of consumerism, we're going to need four Earths. So one of two things is going to happen. Either from the supply and demand curve, demand being greater than the ability to supply, prices will go up. Or the divide between those that can afford and those that cannot afford, the digital divide, will widen far greater than it currently is, excluding large pockets of society from digital inclusion. With highly skilled technicians, with carefully crafted processes, we can bring the highest standard of technology to you in large volume. And our investment into our, our remanufacturing facility is an enabling innovation crafted to ISO 7 to protect you and help you identify the quality you need to make the right final decision. One case study recently showing our flexibility and our ability uh, was a client that ordered uh, 5,000 laptops uh, before the pandemic. Uh, we delivered the last shipment uh, this month in August, so we were delivering over the pandemic. Uh, the client saved in excess of £2 million pounds, uh, with us, is delighted and we're welcoming them back for their second order shortly. So the, the question of um, you know, why is remanufacturing important on the basis that we're running out of, out of raw, raw reserves, um, we, we know that we're running um, sh short um, and we only have to look at, at how that's impacted the supply chain. But when we discuss um, the drivers that are going to help remanufacturing of IT specifically get across the line, 
we look to um, the commitments of government and big users towards uh, net zero carbon, which is the, the centre of, the, of this discussion. So three laptops is equivalent uh, output uh, will be about a tonne of CO2. Um, and just to sort of frame what a tonne of CO2 looks like, it would roughly fill a three bedroom house here in the UK. So if, um, if, 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 you, uh, if you assume that you have three laptops in an average three bedroom house on a one-to-one -one basis, then your replacement, your linear buying habits mean that every three or four years, you know, you're responsible for indirectly putting up uh, a ton of CO2 into the atmosphere. So by using remanufacturing, we, we avoid that happening. Additionally, it's incredibly uh, resource intensive to create technology. 190,000 litres of, of water per device is estimated to be used from the mine through the smelting factories, the refining factories through production, and finally through distribution and, and through use is, is what is deemed to be um, a problem for the, uh, for the laptop industry. There's 1200 kilos of waste needed to, to be mined. There's obviously toxic pollution in the supply chain. Um, and and the reuse the reuse model obviously eliminates e-waste, which is on the rise. I use this model. I'm just going to quickly get a, a laser pen just to help me here. Um, the this this demonstrates the kind of complexity of of a device from from the mines at the bottom. They find their way through to the uh, the sub assembly into the main assembly and then through to distribution. The interesting thing is, is, is that that is of a mouse as opposed to a laptop. And you can only imagine that, that a laptop is far more, um, far more superior in terms of its complexity. So the, the, the question that, that we have for industry, I suppose, is why wouldn't you take the embodied values of the R&D and the investments in the materials of a product once used and use it as your core materials? So what we've been able to do is to uh, identify uh, certain product sets that we can remanufacture. We can't remanufacture every laptop that's made. We can only do this with six or seven particular models that we have spent our own R&D time and, and money in to get to um, the quality of ISO 8887, which is what we discussed in that previous uh, slide. So the lessons that we have learned is, is being the first is really hard. Uh, and if you are leading by example and taking those chances, you're actually laying laying the uh, the footsteps in the sand for others to follow so being the first is being hard you know you have to be open to to provide solutions to problems that, that that haven't even shown their face yet they don't exist and so what that requires is a team of uh, a broad depth and, and knowledge to help you uh, overcome the barriers that, that that throw themselves up on a daily basis and obviously have a business that is is able to keep learning uh, build collaborations through industry and academia and create multiple outcomes. So for us, multiple outcomes will look towards the themes of sustainability. We look at the economic output. Um, so our products are cheaper to the end user, but they also provide us with a profit. So that's sustainable for both customer and supplier. Um, it's um, socially advantageous so that we invest into social programs. And obviously there's an environmental benefit in terms of the, the CO2 reduction and uh, the resource preservation. Um, so where we are in, in 2020, uh, what we've learned is that the, the, the world is a really fragile place. Um, the supply chain, um, particularly with, with IT, became incredibly um, volatile in terms of its pricing and very fragile in terms of, of the, the actual supply. Uh, we also know that the pandemic wasn't biased to people, uh, race or religion. And it made the supply chains adjust and customers to rethink. So what basically happened in 2020, the, um, the IT supply chain choked. So there was PPE, there was track and trace, and then there was mobile technology. As everybody scampered home to have a work from home or an educate from home solution. So the supply chains literally dried up as the toilet roll, the pandemic in early COVID version one. This, it was very similar. Laptops were just scarce in the supply chain which meant for, cu for customers who needed their workers to be um, productive, they had to think of an alternative, alternative solution. And we just happened to be positioned in the right place with product to bring on new customers. Um, so I guess 2020 has been a very fortuitous year for, for us. 
and what's coming is is important so uh the pandemic has has, has made people rethink so you'll hear the uh, build back better agenda the build back greener agenda coming out of westminster uh, we're leaving uh, the european union there's a new environmental bill coming and centered to the environmental bill are themes of resource preservation and protection of climate and of course there's cop 26 which is which is in 11 months time um, and the, the UK government particularly will be very much focused on bringing some, some good, easy wins to that conference. Um, and, you know, as I say, we're delighted to have a position on the Crown Commercial Services Framework to allow now large, um, large public sector bodies to, to consume a remanufactured devices. And I'll leave you with this slide. So the, the future actually isn't unknown. We've had a chance this year to rethink what that might look like. And it will be different. The sustainability is becoming incredibly noisy that everybody is trying to figure out what it means to them. But, but what it means in the dictionary and what it means to us is as prescribed on that slide. Thanks, Steve. That's uh, that, that's really good. Um, could I ask Parley's if you've got questions for Steve, just to post them in the uh, the, the question box or the chat? Uh, just uh, put a Q in front of uh, a question and a C in front of uh, comments for that. That was uh, really good, Steve. Thank you. Um, and really interesting that you you are going to be proactively involved in the COP. COP26 um, in terms of supplying the, the, the IT equipment as well. So it's, it's really positive. Um, Tom, um, can you upload your slide, please? Yeah, um, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Steve. Uh, oh, Steve, would it be possible to take your screen down? Thank you. Okay, hopefully uh, that's up on everyone's screens. Um, so uh, I'm Tom, I'm speaking from uh, Egg Lighting. We're based in Glasgow and uh, we're a lighting uh, supplier. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna be talking today about is uh, remanufacture the future of sustainable lighting? Um, so yeah, just to introduce myself, uh, I'm, my background is in remanufacture uh, from an academic perspective. Um, I've also worked in R&D um, and I think uh, from my own perspective I found that those two things need to be uh, really well connected. Um, so for people who aren't aware this is really what we're talking about when we speak about lighting. Um, this is an inside photo from one of our lights and all of these little um, yellow cubes are individual LEDs so they're about five millimeter by five millimeter um, this is an industrial light uh, and there's quite a few of them uh, and they're you know, highly integrated products, quite energy intense to produce, um, but uh, a massive improvement on previous lighting technologies. So you might be thinking, what's the problem then? We've got, we've got LEDs now, the energy efficiency is massively improved on fluorescent or incandescent. Um, and for me, this gets to the bottom of the problem. So this is data from the Environment Agency last year um, and just focusing on fittings, so complete light fittings um, and non-household, which is the sphere that we operate in commercial lighting, 42,000 tonnes of light fittings were supplied to the market in the UK alone uh, last year. And there's a little bit more complexity than just this, but the minimum rate of that that we know has been recycled is 6%. So 6% of light fittings supplied to the market are being recycled. Uh, and, and as we all know, recycling is sort of the lowest form of uh, treatment in the circular economy. So there's a, there's a huge amount of material waste being created in our sector uh, that isn't being dealt with properly by the WE Directive. Um, and uh, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I can't visualize 42,000 tons of uh, electronic waste. Well, this is, uh, this is the new electric buses being rolled out in Scotland. Uh, so that's equivalent to over 3000 of these buses per year. Um, really a staggering amount of waste. So this is where egg lighting 
like to think we come in anyway. So we were born in 2013. We mostly supply Scotland, um, but also a little bit of north of England. And I'd like to echo really what Steve was saying in that we're trying to balance uh, a circular economy approach with also delivering good price options uh, because we found we don't want to be operating uh, just in a kind of um, a high end, low volume. Uh, the biggest environmental impact is to be found in the mass market. So before we get started, I need to, to kind of center the issue. So uh, in lighting, uh, this was a, a life cycle analysis that was conducted for one of our products. And the overwhelming majority of the environmental impact is in the use phase, uh, rather than production and distribution. Now, obviously, that waste that is produced over a light's lifetime, that might be five years, it might be 10 years, um, is obviously really significant, but we do have to we have to be scientific and focus on the use as well. So, so what does remanufacturing mean in that context? Um, and this this lovely graph here is called Heitz's law. If anyone has heard of Moore's law uh, for uh, computing, this is the lighting equivalent of that. Um, and Heitz predicted that the cost of LEDs would reduce by a factor of ten, and their light output would increase by a factor of 20 per decade. Um, and it's been, it's been staggeringly true. And obviously this can't, this can't be the case forever, but we are still seeing new LED efficiencies uh, continuing this trend. So LEDs are getting cheaper by the year and they're also getting more efficient by the year. So what we wanna do with that is we want to make sure that um, our customers have the best efficacy lighting possible because that reduces their energy bills it also reduces their carbon um, their carbon emissions but but what actually happens if we just install a light and leave it there is um, it gets worse so the LEDs dim the lights get a little bit dusty the light output decreases um, so what we see is the gap between these two lines so the green line being Heitz's law and uh, the orange line being a, a sort of install one and done and we see that as the gap uh, for for where we should be aiming so we thought why don't we do this why don't we periodically upgrade the leds in our customers uh, lights and by doing so we can bring them uh, up to the maximum energy efficacy our customers can be saving tens of thousands of pounds on their energy bills uh, and reducing their carbon output so here in comes our lighting as a service model. So under, under a linear model, which Steve's already talked about, um, this doesn't really make much sense because we're actually, we would be incentivized to, to scrap the entire light fitting uh, and to sell a new one, which is obviously extremely wasteful and extremely expensive. Um, so what we're transitioning to is lighting as a service where we retain ownership of the base fitting or the core and we make design decisions and process decisions which enable us to um, upgrade the smallest possible amount of the light in order to uh, upgrade the performance. Um, and in tandem with that, we're trying to kind of move our, our business model towards dematerialization. So in lighting, a lot of uh, value now is being created through controls, internet of things, uh, you know, lights are obviously dispersed throughout most commercial buildings, uh, perfect for creating uh, an industrial uh, Internet of Things network um, and also sensor technology. So we're trying to move towards those benefits uh, rather than a model based on uh, selling new products. Um, and another thing that the lighting as a service model allows us to overcome is warranty risk. So a typical luminaire to a commercial uh, customer will have a five year warranty. After that five years, obviously, uh, as the failure rate increases, the customer is going to be increasingly looking at their lights and thinking, I can't be, I can't be dealing with this. Um, I'm not able to get repairs for these. They're highly integrated uh, and I'm going to scrap the lot. So through our model, we take complete responsibility for maintenance um, and, and that's enabling us to kind of overcome product obsolescence. Uh, so, so jumping back, so this lovely graph that I've shown you here where we're doing periodic upgrades and uh, harnessing the energy savings, 
that, that might sound very advanced, but it's actually really the case of how commercial lighting used to be done uh, when we had fluorescent tubes. Um, these are probably familiar to people, office lighting or industrial lighting. Um, and fluorescent tubes as well could actually be recycled quite well because they're mostly metal and glass. Um, we won't speak about the mercury. Um, but LEDs have changed the design philosophy of light manufacturers very significantly. So 2009, Philips came out with these LED bulbs. These aren't the sorts of things that will be installed uh, in a commercial setting. Um, but uh, on the right, I think this is quite a provocative image. So this is from the UK manufacturer Thorn. Uh, their top light, probably around the 1940s. It's got a, uh, a quite nice uh, fitting, but um, a removable light source. And in 2020, they're very sleek, very thin, very integrated uh, product at the bottom. Uh, plastics, metals, um, impossible to disassemble, impossible to recycle, uh, definitely impossible to replace and upgrade the light source. Um, so this really uh, puts the um, puts the onus on uh, lighting providers to to kind of make the change possible. And uh, this image I've given an entire slide. This is my nemesis, the flat panel. Um, these are sold in absolutely obscene quantities because they're amazingly cheap, uh, imported from China, um, and actually 75% of all lighting sold in the UK now is imported rather than uh, manufactured domestically. Um, and these, these lights are low quality, uh, poor, poor light quality as well, impossible to disassemble, impossible to upgrade. Um, so they epitomize everything that we're trying to move away from. Um, and and what we see as the solution instead is, is replaceable LED modules. So this is the, the light that I showed you at the start of the presentation. And you can see that we've got the LEDs mounted onto an aluminium circuit board. And we're able to simply remove uh, that circuit board and upgrade periodically as, as technology advances. And this is our stroma fitting, which is another industrial fitting, uh, again, where we're we're able to remove and replace the LED strip. Uh, so we've taken quite quite an open, a collaborative, uh, a modular approach. Other companies uh, are looking for sort of proprietary module replacements. Um, we don't really support that as an approach because um, it, it's limiting. It, it doesn't foster collaboration in the lighting supply chain. Um, and just to, just to um, uh, sort of bring this back to the science. This is uh, results from a life cycle analysis uh, for one of our luminaires. So on the far left is the uh, relative environmental impact uh, of a new product. And if we remanufacture the product, the fewer components that we, we have to replace, obviously the better from an environmental point of view. Um, not, you know, there's, there's a lot more to, to that decision than just environment, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and this sort of balances with that graph where I'm, I'm talking about in use, because again, we have to remember that uh, the in use environmental impact of the luminaire does dominate its, its um, through use uh, impact, but just for the end of life scenario uh, as well. And so, so this is all, all fantastic. And then um, at the start of this year, uh, in comes some legislation and this is the sort of infamous in our industry, Article 4, uh, which specifies that manufacturers shall ensure that light sources and separate control gears can be replaced with the use of commonly available tools. So this is, you know, this feels like massive validation um, uh, that our approach uh, is, is sort of being uh, enshrined in legislation. Um, unfortunately, not everyone in the lighting industry is unanimous in their support for this, but what we really see this as opening up is uh, a great opportunity for lighting to be um, uh, sort of returned to a model where the base light fitting might be standardized, um, the light sources can be replaced and uh, the cores can be remanufactured to extend their lifetime. So uh, after this legislation has come out, we've seen already quite a lot of innovation in new, new connectors uh, replaceable light sources for LEDs, uh, which is fantastic. So uh, just to briefly mention uh, the way that we we kind of um, direct our efforts when we're when we're designing luminaires. So 
um, we've we've kind of adapted a simplified method from uh, BS four five 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 three, and the the four key things that we take into account to make sure that the luminaires that we install today we're going to be able to upgrade and remanufacture through their life because that's now a, a liability that we've taken on. We have to do this, um, and that that really uh, for us is robustness and residual value. So will the product uh, last into the future? Um, the speed of the upgrade process. So a lot of luminaires are really challenging, time consuming to disassemble um, and remanufacture. Uh, also the availability of spares. So I think I've already mentioned that we, we very much prefer modular approaches um, and standardized approaches because it means that the entire supply chain uh, is able to, um, to produce those and, and also going forward into you know 20 years, 25 years, that there should still be mechanically compatible um, components uh, for those lights. Uh, and then finally, the cost of spares and treatment. So again, um, uh, we need to make sure that we'll be able, economically effective as well to continue uh, upgrades and remanufacture. Um, another thing that I think is really important to mention uh, for us is that um, it's not simply a question of changing what we do, but it's it's also very much wrapped up in process. So lighting uh, obviously has very onerous performance and safety requirements, uh, and we we really have to make sure that we integrate that. Uh, I can see Steve, Steve nodding, so uh, I think this is uh, shared with a lot of electronics for remanufacture. Um, but we we have to be very cautious to fully document all of the testing that we do, the process that we go through. Um, for the waste electrical uh, and electronic equipment directive, but also for um, BS standards uh, that relate to safety. Um, and, and I think in that regard, we're, we're kind of in our industry moving quite a long way ahead of legislation, um, which, which isn't really set up to encourage um, the circular treatment of complete luminaires. Um, and uh, finally, a, a good point to, to bring up is that remanufacturing upgrade uh, is new to our customers. So we, we have to work quite a lot on educating them about why it's, why it's um, something that they should invest in, what the benefits are to them, the cost savings uh, and the environmental reporting. Um, but, but really what we've actually found is that those conversations do go quite easily. Um, facilities managers that we speak to uh, completely understand uh, the return to replaceable light sources. Um, uh, and just finally to uh, talk about uh, kind of where we're moving uh, on from now. Uh, so we, we uh, recognize the importance of uh, integrating our process with data. And we, we see that as a key enabler for our remanufactured process. So uh, we're partnering with a company called Reef in Edinburgh. Uh, and Innovate UK and are investigating the feasibility of a digital twin uh, asset tracking system. Uh, so another change that's coming through legislation is uh, the requirement of online accessible product information. Uh, and we're very keen to, to integrate that into our remanufacture process to kind of increase the efficiency of our remanufacture um, and also uh, the documentation process. So just to wrap up really, um, a little bit of kind of top level process for us as we've, we've transitioned from a linear towards a circular uh, remanufacture based model. So the first thing to do really was uh, aligning our business objectives with circularity. So while the business is oriented on uh, selling products, uh, meaningful progress towards remanufacture uh, wouldn't be possible. Um, so, so the integration, the introduction of our lighting as a service model has been key. Um, and then next is defining the direction. So remanufacture isn't the only option in the circular economy. Um, and we needed to kind of follow a science-based life cycle analysis approach to determining how we should design our process. Uh, then we've been developing our capability um, and also uh, collaborations with suppliers who are able to fill capability that we don't have. Um, and then phasing in our new uh, model. Um, 
making sure that we don't make significant mistakes, we don't let customers down uh, and, and damage their understanding of what remanufactured lighting is. So that's all for me. Um, hopefully that was useful. I'll be really pleased to take any questions. Thanks, Tom. That was uh, that was really insightful and really good, really encouraging to see what's going on within the uh, the lighting industry, uh, an essential component to everyday life. So it's good to see it's it's moving to a sustainable model. Um, so this is where we we open the floor to parties to uh, ask any questions. We can do this in uh, in two ways. Parties can uh, raise their hand or uh, type their question into the uh, the chat box um, while you guys are. Um, starting to do that, I'll, I'll probably ask the, the first question to, to both, and that's: Are you beginning to see a, a change in character from your client base uh, in terms of seeking out more sustainable solutions that they can either report their uh, their environmental kind of impact or reduction in environmental impact for their operations? Or do you see them seeking for more kind of ethically sourced components or, or products in both your areas? And um, Steve, I'll, I'll ask yourself first, and then Tom, I'll, I'll go on to you after. Uh, that's a good question, Paul. I think um, uh, sustainability means different things to, to different people. Um, with, with our product set, there are probably five pillars of, of sustainability. There's obviously um, uh, getting rid of e-waste, there's obviously CO2 output in, in, in production, in, in the use phase, in the, in the, way, in the waste phase. There, there is ethical uh, supply of materials, conflict minerals. So there's, there's a whole bunch of things. I mean, a whole bunch of different things to different people. But ultimately, I think I'll, I'll, I'll reflect back onto Tom. If, if you're asking your client to, to make a compromise away from what they're used to, it's too much of a leap of faith that there's not almost enough value in, in the sustainability themes to warrant them taking that that risk personally, um, and and so we like Tom, we work hard on educating the client around the sustainability themes, aligning ourselves to what they think, and, um, and and that's why net zero for us is a key driver in the next twelve months and beyond, because that that is the the, the marker that everybody's really kind of driving towards, and so we we use that as the theme then to unlock everything else. Uh, Tom? Yeah, I, um, for us, you, firstly, definitely, there's, there's massive interest in uh, circular lighting and, in general, uh, su sustainable lighting, whatever that may be. Um, but um, again, you know, what Steve said as well completely resonates in that we, we have to work really hard on educating. And a lot of our customers are very much skeptical, and I, I think rightly so, uh, because the introduction of LEDs was very much heralded as the future of sustainable lighting and and the fact that we're now returning to a removable light source um, design uh, to a lot of people feels like a backtrack and i would argue that 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 direction for the lighting industry of integrated uh, light sources was misguided um, so people we we really have to be open we have to be really transparent and we have to explain uh, our methodology uh, and reasoning and, and also be really clear about the benefits that we're giving to our customers. Because, um, um, yeah, and, and finally as well, um, I'd say the value of providing ESG reporting um, to our customers is huge. So when whenever we remanufacture luminaires, uh, we, we measure the, the waste reduction, the carbon equivalent reduction, um, and we, we try and provide that information to our customers and that helps them justify the decisions that they're making and so on that on that basis does that put more pressure on both of both of you from your organizations to keep that life cycle analysis relevant but then track that data so then you're able to pass on that that intel to the company so that they can see not only the commercial but the ethical kind of benefits they're they're receiving or the environmental impacts that they're receiving from from adopting both uh, both practices i suppose yeah, absolutely. And, and that's something that we're hoping our uh, digital platform that I was speaking of uh, will be able to track more accurately, uh, but also uh, share with, with our clients um, easier. Okay. Um, Tom, a specific question from yourself. Uh, what is the supply line 
for the spent LEDs you've replaced. That's what's currently happening, I guess, to those those LEDs that you're replacing. Yeah, so so the the used LEDs, um, as as with luminaires in general, um, they they should go through the the we um, process, which means that they should be collected by an approved treatment facility, um, and there they'll be uh, recycled for as much material reuse as possible. Um, unfortunately, LEDs is very challenging um, because they're so integrated; a lot of energy goes into producing them. Uh, and they've got small quantities of quite a, a number of materials. Um, and to my knowledge, there isn't a commercially viable uh, LED module specific uh, recycling process yet, but I think we'll see that changing because the moment we're collecting LED modules uh, as a segregated waste source, um, it, it, it hopefully will be possible uh, to, to see that advance. Um, but in, in Shorter terms is, is shredding and recycling. Thanks, Tom. Um, so we've got a question for both you. I'll go to Steve first and then Tom after. So uh, over and above uh, Brexit and COVID, what are the big challenges for your business in the next 10 years? Uh, <laughs> um, I think that the, the number one challenge for us Internally, we look at it like an accelerator and a, and a, and a clutch in a car. Um, you know, build it and they will come is quite a dangerous commercial strategy because we did build it and they didn't come in, in, at, at the pace that we wanted them to. Um, not really recognizing um, the behavior of the end user. As a company, we were very much in the trade, a wholesaler, if you like. Um, and we needed to get closer to the customer. So the, the challenge for us is going to be if we're to go from 10,000 units a month to say 20,000 units a month, the commercial pressure that puts on us in terms of resource, resourcing up our human resources, uh, the capital involved, the, the, the cash involved in remanufacturing, the consumption of product before it's market ready is probably a six, a six month fuse for us. So all of that is, is, a, is a risk that needs to be managed. And it's about managing the accelerator and the clutch. How, how much production do we need to manage our supply? And vice versa, we don't want to have too much supply that customers are being let down. So it's that's our current that's our current challenge. And most likely for the foreseeable future, I can see that being the way. Demand is definitely coming. I can I can really feel that COVID and with Brexit and the new environmental bill, the power that that gives the secretaries of state and along alongside DEFRA. Uh, DEFRA have a, an IT, greening IT strategy that says a percentage of purchases must be remanufactured as part of resource preservation and, and climate mitigation. These key themes are now being sort of top table in government and then COP, COP26 is around the corner. So sort of almost the perfect storm and the, the stars are aligning and we don't want to be too successful too quickly, I guess. Yeah, I, I think uh, for for egg lighting, our uh, sort of main area for the next ten years is is building capability. So I think we're uh, in terms of output, we're we're a long way behind circular computing, um, but uh, we're very keen to do that on a local basis as well. Um, partly because of the logistics of uh, transporting lighting, um, but but in addition to that as well, there's been such a massive boom in. Uh, in Internet of Things and control um, and and software integration with lighting, um, and we're very much at the forefront of that. So we're actually um, in the process of CE marking our own brand product uh, for Bluetooth mesh uh, controls of lighting, which is very exciting. Um, and I think uh, an ongoing um, challenge for us is is merging that with our circular economy approach uh, and setting up procedures for remanufacturing those products as well. Brilliant. That's good. Um, and in terms of, uh, because we're talking about remanufacturing here, how have you both found the kind of existing standards uh, or legislation kind of supporting or, or that journey for actually identifying what you guys need to actually do to help recertify your products and get them to, to market? Do you think there's still a risk there that there could be a, a change in the wrong direction? Um, or, or do you think that there's good movement in your, your bespoke areas 
in enabling you to grow the business, to grow the market share? Um, I think that um, the British Standards Institute are doing a great job. Um, they have they have global uh, connectivity with other geos that are doing magnificent work in the same space. Um, as an organisation, we are kite mark pending, so we we have taken the charge and gone okay. The, the, the customer needs to have a quality assurance against which they can make a buying decision, particularly in the public sector, and that's the sector that can make the most impact most quickly. So we need to layer up some third party verification that goes, you know, these guys are saying this and they actually do that. Um, the world of remanufacture or in the you know, last decade, the world of second hand is very much a dark art. It's very much under the table. And if you don't know how the world works, you could be forgiven. It's like Steptoe and Son or, a, you know, a guy walking down the street with a, with a cart and a horse. It operates the same way. He'll take away your rubbish and he'll make, he'll make money out of it. But the, but the industry has really grown up to be something very away from that. Yet perception is still very much caught in how that is, particularly within IT. People see IT perhaps as, as the, the man drawer in the house. It's where unwanted products live. It's not a place they want to go and buy from. So for us, it's about making sure the customer isn't compromised and working with an organization like BSI to make sure that that is possible. So we expect by the end of uh, quarter one in March or April next year to have that kite mark. And that hopefully will do a lot for the uh, uh, the remanufacturing industry as a, as a whole. It will, it will hopefully elevate the whole of that industry to a different place because a laptop is something that everybody, everybody does use. And once they start calling for remanufactured devices as part of their procurement, then everybody else should benefit. I think um, in in our industry, the 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 rate of change uh, in in legislation, particularly, is is colossal just at the moment. So we've had uh, the single lighting regulations, as I mentioned, um, and also the eco design uh, requirements for lighting. So all of this really is pushing lighting in the right direction. Um, I think perhaps there are some some missed opportunities at the moment uh, in lighting specific standards so uh, bs 6059a is the key standard for lighting safety and performance and uh, there's there's no mention there of any circular economy approaches so we would really like to see um, uh, progress in that area uh, because for for remanufacturers in the lighting industry it does feel a little bit like we're in an, in a gray area where we're doing everything we can uh, to be diligent and work to standards as best as possible. Uh, however, uh, if you're if you're remanufacturing a batch of say uh, 150 luminaires, you're you're simply not going to be able to go through a 10,000 pound certification process. Um, so so we need to work towards practical solutions for that. Um, but in general, I think the uh, the like I've said, the, the rate of change of standards and uh, legislation is is really encouraging. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and I guess one one last one, and then we'll we'll wrap up the session. You know, you, you both have great products. So how best are our industry to engage with you to actually see if if your products and offering are, you know, um, in line with their needs? Is it just kind of follow your web page and do general inquiry, or what, what's the best route to to engage your organisations? Uh, from, from our point of view, we have a direct and indirect, so we, we work on, on frameworks, but fundamentally, if the buyer isn't asking for a remanufactured device, if in the public sector specifically, they're only asking for a brand new device to a certain specification, that often locks us out of competition. So for us, it, it is about education. They can reach out directly, you know, you know Paul, we do a lot of um, webinars like this to try and to try and educate audiences and, and, and to bring people into the room um, but you'll be surprised even even with people that I know who are massively into sustainability and massively into uh, what we're trying to achieve they'll 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 turn around and they'll go and buy brand new again because it's just a behavior they're locked into so for us it's about winning um, two or three really key key accounts that we can we can lever the, the value from 
Uh, and that's what the next sort of six to nine months is for me, is, is to maybe work with two or three of the, the large departments in central government on a slowly, slowly basis, but get some capacity built. And then we can roll that down through through chosen departments. Tom? Yeah, so for ourselves, I think the, the best route is through our website, uh, which is egglighting.com. Um, and we are based in Glasgow as well. So uh, if um, if the business is, is reasonably local or uh, in our sphere of operation, then we would typically uh, look to do a, a survey quite early on in the process because uh, quite often we find we, we have a little bit of a dialogue with customers where uh, they tell us what they think they want or, or what they've, they've had before. And we're able to suggest to them alternatives which uh, have a better environmental uh, impact or which might save them money or be more future proof. Great, thank you. That's grand. Um, so once again, thank you very much, Steve, Tom, for your time. Brilliant presentations, very informative. Great to see what's happening in the uh, remanufacturing supply chain, moving in the right direction. Um, thank you for our participants. And um, this will be uploaded onto YouTube. All the links will be shared via email drop and also uploaded onto our Scottish Institute Free Manufacturing website. Uh, please do check it out for future events. Um, and all that's left to say is that thank you and have a good remainder of the week. Cheers. Thank you.